Thank you, Mary Jane, for that great rendition of Glorify Thy Name. This morning, we're going to sing together some songs about God's goodness in our lives. And if we would think together about that, we could think of many things that the Lord has done in our lives. It would be great to have just a testimony time to talk about that. Because I'm sure we'd hear some incredible things, wouldn't we? How God has been faithful to each one of us. We're going to sing, start the service off by singing uh, uh, 10,000 Reasons to Bless the Lord. And although I'm not going to ask you to stand, will you sing with us as we sing this song? Bless the Lord, O my soul.
It's a beautiful day the Lord has made, and we are so glad he gave us some rain today. And I just want to welcome you, and if you are a visitor this morning, we'd like you to fill out in our bulletin. We have a little area here. We'd love to hear from you. And also, if you have any prayer requests, our staff, we pray Monday mornings for prayer requests, so put those in the offering. And we have a hot sheet up here. Yes, you may be seated. I'm sorry. Go ahead, and you may be seated. Today is a special day. The kids are excited. Some of them are already over there. Today is our church picnic at Emmanuel High School, and you're welcome to go to that. We want to invite you to that. Also, um, there is early registration for summer camp at Heartland, so parents read those details about that. And last on our hot sheet is the office remodel. We are remodeling our office and so we are relocated to the student center so feel free to go and check that out and also I would just want you to see the rose over here we are really happy that Marie and Matt Harder have adopted and Jace is his name and also we have three balloons today two from Bob Hilt's ministry and also one from a young person at Palm Village so let's give a hand for those items over there thank you And lastly, uh, this Thursday is, and there's a little brochure about Thursday is is our National Day of Prayer, May 1st. So if you'd like to be involved in this, read the details in the community, but it's a special day for that. So thank you for coming and enjoy your morning. Thanks, Ann. Let's stand together as we read scripture. Psalm 36, 5 through 7a. Let's read this out loud. Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains, your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. How priceless is your unfailing love, O oh God. Aren't you thankful for his love this morning? Let's sing of his faithfulness in our lives. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. My changes not, thy compassions they fail not. And thou hast been the forever will be. Oh, 
Thank you, choir. That's a pretty powerful reminder, reminder to be reminded that the blood of Jesus is our all. That it is only upon Christ that we are to, to put our faith, to put our trust. It is only in Him that we can truly find forgiveness and redemption and forgiveness of our sins. Many of you were, have been praying for Bob and Wanda Croker this past week. And uh, many of you may also know that their eldest daughter that we were praying for, Sherry Musgrave, she did go home to be with the Lord about two days ago. She had suffered a massive brain aneurysm. And uh, was speaking with Bob last night, they would like you all to know that there is going to be a graveside service this coming Friday, May the 2nd, here at the Reedley Cemetery at 9 a.m., and that uh, any who would like to, there will be a memorial service again on Friday at 1.30 p.m. at the Butler MB Church, which is where their daughter Sherry was a member and attended. So let's continue to be lifting up the croakers in prayer and ushers as you will get ready as we uh, go to prayer now. Father, what a, what a powerful word we read a uh, few moments ago together. That your love reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies, your righteousness is like the mighty mountains, that your justice is like the great deep. And in all of that to see that you are utterly unfathomable. You are so much bigger than anything else that we can imagine. Father, the the depths of your love, the the grandeur of your faithfulness, the the power of your righteousness, the, the, the... all-encompassing nature of your justice. We simply cannot fathom it. And Father, it is in difficult times, it is in troubling times that we again need to be reminded of that, need to again be reminded to come to you, to cling to you, that, that you are the shelter in the storm, that you are our shield. Father, that, that though we may be facing difficulty, that your love is ever-present and it surrounds us and, and it is preeminently known in our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so, Father, we ask today, we think specifically on Bob and Wanda and ask that, that your love would again surround them, that your peace would encompass them as they mourn the loss of their daughter, that, that you would give them a sense of understanding, but Father, that you would also fill them just with your presence and with the comfort of the Holy Spirit. And Father, for others who are here this morning that we don't know what it is that, do, that they are dealing with, that they too would know the great depth of your unfailing love, that they too would again come and, and, and cling to the cross of Jesus Christ, to fall at the feet of the Savior, that they again would hear your comforting word of peace and redemption to them. Father, we also want to pray for our missionaries, Saji and Bindu, and ask, Father, as they are at work in Turkey to see the gospel spread and go out, that you would watch over them and their household, that you would protect them. Father, we thank you for the the great uh, uh, response that they saw at Easter. We thank you for the work that you are doing through them, and we continue to ask for fruit. We continue to ask that people's lives would be changed as they encounter the living God and as they encounter the living gospel of Jesus Christ. And we especially pray, Father, for an anointing upon their work as they are are working with Muslims and with other uh, Eastern Asians and and ask, Father, that again, that they would just see great fruit out of that work. We thank you for the privilege that we have to be able to stand with them in your work there. Father, now as we continue to worship by giving back to you out of the abundance that you have given to us and giving back in worship in our tithes and our offerings, may you add your blessing to them today. Father, may they continue to grow, and as they go in in ministry here at the church, as they go out into our community of Reedley, as they literally go around the world to the missionaries that we have the great privilege of being in partnership with in all things, may Christ be made known. And we pray this in his name. Amen.
Amen. Thank you, Mary Jane. Jesus loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. Hold on to those thoughts because we'll hear more about that as we study God's word together in a little bit. If I'm a little distracted this morning, would you forgive me? We welcomed our 11th grandchild yesterday. Uh, A little boy was born to uh, our middle child, our son, John, and his wife, Emily, down in Southern California. So if Connie's missing in the choir, she got some, she heard somebody go into 99. She jumped in the trunk and uh, went on down there with them. But uh, we're grateful for little Gavin Wesley born yesterday. So praise God with us. Thank you. Um, let's stand and greet one another and choir come join us as we be prepare to study God's word. All right, thank you. It's good to be together today. I hope you all feel welcome to join us at the picnic. There is indoor seating. There's adequate parking, so... uh, Even if you have difficulty walking, I think it'll be, um, you'll be able to get there well. So I invite you to come and be part of that. Todd, once again, if you would put up the slide for the uh, National Day of Prayer, I'd appreciate that. I want to call our church to participate. This particular slide is a focus on the evening event at Pioneer Park when we'll gather together as a community to spend about an hour, maybe a little less, in prayer for our nation and for our community. And it's our privilege to do that uh, without feeling hindered in any way. So come out. Let's be well represented to uh, signal to the community that we're part of them, that we're part of this, that we uh, want to be a, a part of what's going on. So uh, what isn't mentioned there, but oh, in your journal, is that there's also a prayer breakfast, the uh, annual mayor's prayer breakfast at the community center. You can get a ticket at our connection counter today or just arrive and buy a ticket at the door. You'd be most welcome to come. And the speaker is one of our local missionary pastors who works in the community of New London. And you will uh, appreciate what he has to share. So I invite you to be part of that. For a few weeks, Pastor Malcolm and I are going to be leading you in some teaching what uh, what we're calling some topical messages around uh, today's the picnic Sunday. Uh, in two weeks, we'll have um, Mother's Day. Two weeks after that is Memorial Sunday. So we're going to preach around those themes. They're going to be biblical and expository. And then in June, we'll return for a while to First Corinthians. So if you just have want to know, have a sense of where we're going uh, with the Easter break, we've chosen to, to follow this pattern. So today, I want to take you to Ephesians chapter 5. And what I want to say in an opening is that I hope that there are times when what you read in the Bible um, is somewhat uh, startling, that it shakes you a little bit, that it causes you to step back and, as you say, scratch your head and say, really, God, is that really what you mean? Is that is that what you want of me? Uh, I, w- I would hope that the Bible would be would so be so deep, so different, so uh, so impacting our lives that that we don't immediately understand everything at face value that. That, it, that the depth of it calls us to attention. And so today I want to take you to one of those passages that did that for me. Uh, as I was looking at it, suddenly I, I was startled by the, by the call to greatness, the call to depth, the, 
the challenge, one of the, uh, as I looked at it, I thought, Lord, this is an impossible thing you're asking of us here. And the statement is the opening line of Ephesians 5 that says, be imitators of God. And I looked at that and I said, really? How am I to be an imitator of God? God is so, uh, so infinite. God is, uh, is so demanding. God is so perfect. God is holy. God is righteous. God is absolute. And I am not. I'm so fallible. I'm so, I have so many tendencies toward selfishness and my own way. How am I to imitate God? And I realized it wasn't the first time that in Scripture we are called to that kind of standard. Back in the law, in Leviticus chapter 19, 2, God said to the children of Israel, Be holy, for the Lord, I, the Lord your God, am holy. I wonder what the Israelites thought about that and, and how to achieve that. Jesus, in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, 48, says, Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Your Father in heaven is perfect. We could talk about that for a while, couldn't we? And then there's Luke 6, 36. Jesus says, be merciful just as your father is merciful. And that's where I think we begin to get a clue of what we're talking about here as we realize the relationship, the familial relationship that we can have with God by being able to call him father. For a moment, I want to remind you of, of uh, the statement that we have that shapes what our vision for our church in these days. It's a, the four-part statement that you see on the cover of our bulletin. And uh, uh, if you get a letter from the church, it'll be on there. We, w- we want to elevate uh, God as we worship Him. We want to build our lives around God's Word. We want to be refreshed in, in godly relationships. We want to reach others uh, in our community with the transforming love of Jesus Christ. And for just a moment, think about number two there, the idea of building our lives around God's word. That's that's our call to discipleship. And it it occurred to me that any kind of education, whether it be Christian or other, needs to have an understanding of what is the actual goal of that teaching. What's the purpose? What is the substance of of what you want to where you want to bring somebody in terms of helping them grow and build their lives? And I say that to remind you that for us. At least part of the answer to that has to be that we want to see people become more like Jesus so that the the curriculum, the teaching, the topic, the content out of God's word needs to help us become more godly. To become more godlike. In essence, what we're saying is we want to be imitators of God as we become more like his son, Jesus Christ. Let me tell you a couple of things about that word imitate or to be imitators, because it's a a word that the apostle Paul used is it sounds a lot like our English word for mimic. And that's because it is the root word of our English word for imitate or to mimic something. Uh, There are several forms of it, depending upon where it occurs in a sentence in the Greek language. But one of those would be a word that sounds something like mimetes. To imitate or to mimic. You see, in the ancient Greek world, it was a noble thing to want to be uh, an orator. To be able to go down to the public square and be with the philosophers and stand up and to be able to, to give a speech on a certain topic. To be, to be trained as an orator. And, and memetase was one part of the three-part curriculum for someone who wanted to pursue this way of life, to, be, to be, become a, a, a skilled orator. The first one was theory. They had to learn the whole theory behind what it meant to, to give that kind of a speech. The second was the practical kind, the practice of it. And the third was memetes, mimicking. And so what a student would do in that third part of that curriculum, that they would try to copy or mimic the master orators who had gone before them. I don't know exactly how they did that. They didn't have tape recordings and videos and DVDs, but, but they, would, they would try to imitate, mimic those who had achieved success in that field. Think about that as we think this morning together about Paul's call, Paul's challenge to, to imitate God. In a sense, he is saying that we have to have a, a certain theory behind that. In other words, we have to understand God 
in his mighty acts. We need to know who God is, the, the, the knowledge of God. There needs to be a practical side to that as well. What do we actually what are we supposed to do? But Paul would say that it, to be a, a, a person who is growing in Christ's likeness. Surely you also want to then be able to mimic, mimic, imitate, mimitate, to to be able to imitate the qualities of God. So let's read this text now in its context. And I could have drawn a much larger circle as we study this. In other words, we could have gone further back into chapter four and further down into chapter five. But for this morning, let's keep the target fairly narrow. I'm going to begin with chapter four, verse thirty two. And we're going to read the first two verses of Ephesians five, one and two. Here it is. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Be imitators of God, therefore. Or we could read, therefore, be imitators of God. In light of what he's just said. As dearly loved children and live a life of love. Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. There's our curriculum for building our lives around God's word so that we might be imitators of God. It gives us some of the theory. It gives us some of the practical aspects of it. And it definitely shows us how we can imitate God. Perhaps you noted the the emphasis on love. The love of God and God's love for us and our love toward him. And I want to suggest that in order to to get started, if we want to move in the direction of being imitators of God, we need to begin by learning to know God in his love. To learn about his love and to to learn to love like him. That's the starting point. As Christ has loved us, as God has loved you. I tell you an old story that describes our need for love. It comes out of uh, many years ago in Spain. There was evidently a, a father and son who had a falling out. Uh, their disagreement was so intense that the son ran away from home. And it broke the father's heart. He loved the son. And so he began to, to seek for him. He began to search, going up and down the streets of the city, calling for his son, whose name was Paco. He couldn't find him. And that day after day, finally, in desperation, he he put a note, he put an advertisement, an ad in the newspaper that said, Dear Paco, meet me in front of the newspaper office tomorrow at noon. All is forgiven. Your father. The story goes, that's something of a legend, but the story is that the next day at noon in front of the newspaper office, 800 Pacos showed up. They were, they, were, they were wanting that kind of love and forgiveness from, from a father. You see, our, our text gives us the first idea for being an imitator of God that is as dearly loved children. And that's a clue for us there. That it reminds us that children have a resemblance to their parents. And as children of God, that gives us a capacity to begin imitating God as we recognize that we are indeed his children, that we are indeed his daughters and his sons. And so we can become like our heavenly father. So fascinating. It was fascinating for me recently. You know that Connie and me, uh, we spent a a weekend with the Fairview Mennonite Brethren Church, that community uh, doing uh, um, so many conferences there. And Nancy, you were there. So if, if I repeat anything here, you you just act like it's you've never heard it. OK. All right. Um, but but the deal was my parents spent the last 25 years of their ministry life in Fairview. And then when we moved to Reedley from Kansas, they needed a they needed a, a place to go. And so they followed us here. So the last 25 years in Fairview. So guess what happened the weekend that we were in Fairview? Invariably, people kept saying, man, do you remind me of your father? And so it was my gestures, my hand gestures. One guy even said, man, you even pray like your dad. Because my dad had this way of praying in public and he kind of moved his head like this. And they said, man, you even waggle your head when you're praying, you know. Uh, it, it was just uh, kind of uncanny. Well, I look at it as 
as a compliment, but it reminded me of this principle of children resembling their parents. You know, at least twice in this letter, Paul had already pointed out that the, the relationship that God wants to have with us as his children that reflects that. Back in chapter 1, verse 5, we have this statement that he predestined us to be adopted as his children. See that picture there? That, that God's intention already was that we would be his children so that we could reflect him. Here at closer in chapter 4, verse 24, Paul says that we are created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. You see God's intention in that? Now, the truth is that we can't fulfill this idea of imitating God on our own, in our own strength, in our own skills, talents, whatever we have. We're going to always fall short. But the other side of that is that the possibility is there simply because we are his children. That's the the seedbed of being an imitator of God is that we belong to him. This this, the reason that we can love God at all is that we are his dearly loved children children. That's where we begin. I want you to stop. We want to stop here for just a moment. And in our own hearts, I want you to just receive God's love for a few moments. I want you to to somehow just let God embrace you by just thanking him in your heart that he sees you as his child. That if your name was Paco, he would pursue you. He would come after you. He would say, meet me in front of the church, in front of the newspaper office. Meet me. All is forgiven. Have you, have you rejoiced in that lately? So just stop for a moment. Maybe, let me close your eyes and just with me just say, thank you, God, that you love me. Thank you that you consider me because, of, because you look at your son Jesus, when you look at me, you see Jesus in his atonement on the cross. You love me. You accept me as, a, as your daughter, as your son, as your child. Thank you, God, that I can know you because of your love for me. We praise you for that, Jesus. Thank you for showing us the way. You, son of God, revealed the love of the Father to us. Bask in God's love, would you, friends? Because many times uh, I know that we, we call one another and it's my role to call you to, to faithfulness and to obedience and to a, to a high standard. But you also need to, from time to time, be reminded of God's great love for us and for you. Now, as we go on, we see that Paul gives us some, uh, uh, some practical aspect of that or he gives us the quality or a description of these children who are dearly loved because he says, as dearly loved children, now your goal, your life, your, your lifestyle is to love, live a life of love. Live a life of love. Here's what I see more than anything. That of all the things that God is, of all of his attributes, of all of his relative attributes and the ways that he relates to us. That's what that means. If you see the attributes of God that are that are relative, it's how he, he relates to us out of his love and his mercy and his grace. Those are relative attributes of God. And then there are other attributes of God that are absolute. They're absolute. They, they set him apart. He's distinguished. But in all of those, if you come to the very center, I, be, I believe that it, the best way to imitate God is to live a life of love. Isn't that, after all, the first of the fruit of the Spirit that that Paul describes in Galatians 5? Now, what makes this so both captivating and absolutely challenging is that when we look at this love that God has for us, it is an unconditional love. So I want to unpack that with, with you for a few minutes. Unconditional love, which is so in contrast to our natural way of loving. Years ago, Clarence Jordan did a study of the Sermon on the Mount. And one of the things he observed in there, he thought that he saw a progression of the way God has called his people to love or the way God's people responded to God's love over the centuries. He he said it this way, that before Moses, in pre-Moses, the standard seemed to be unconditional revenge. In other words, you just, it's everybody for himself. 
And you get what you can and you get what's yours and you claim it. Then with the law and Moses came conditional revenge. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. So that at least there's balance, there's some reason, there's a, some uh, fairness to the way that we relate to each other out of the law. But then he says, over the years, the scribes and the teachers of the law, the, the rabbinical schools began to teach that there was at least conditional love. That you loved your own a little bit more than you loved the others. And out of that came this prayer of the, <clears throat> of, the, of the Pharisees, which was, Lord, I thank you that you have not made me a Gentile, a slave or a woman. You know, you think of that, how unthinkable to, to pray that way. But it was uh, the idea that you love your own a little bit more than those who are in sort of a, an, an extending circle. And then Jesus came and particularly in the Sermon on the Mount, taught us. A new way. He raised love to a, another level. And that's why we see in this the, the way of life, the way of peace, the way of grace. As Jesus said, you have heard it said, but I say to you. And he began to talk about a new way of understanding the law, a new way of loving, loving even our enemies, a, a, a new standard, unconditional love. Now, the reality, the stark reality is that somehow innate within us as human beings seems this to be this desire, this need to have to earn love. To earn love from one another and to always want to be earning God's love. And it's difficult for us to, to fully embrace God's grace and to just allow that to keep pouring over us. And so over time, sometimes, in our families and in our churches and between one another, we add a little if to that love. If you... You know, if you please me, I will love you. I will love you a little bit more. If you, if you are, if you meet my needs, and we put all kinds of if conditions within our family. Sometimes as parents, you know, if you get good grades, you'll feel my love more. Or maybe to our spouse, if you, if you can advance, if you get a good job, then I can love you more. All those kinds of things. Sometimes we make our children feel like if, you know, if you don't embarrass me in public, I'll, I'll love you. And Jesus says, I've come, you know, that's what you've heard, I say unto you. And so that unintentionally creeps into the way we love within the body of Christ sometimes. And we expect people to have a certain standard of maybe the way they dress when they show up for church. Or the, uh, the you know, I'll, I'll love you if you agree with me doctrinally. But if we disagree, then, you know, I have to keep you at a distance. Uh, we do this. Uh, in, in many different ways, we can do it with our worship styles and music styles and, and appearances and all those kinds of things. And it's on the basis of that tendency that I want to take you why I included verse 32 of chapter 4 in what we want to look at today. And I think that that statement, Ephesians 4.32, which maybe you memorized as a child, it's a great verse. But it's a wonderfully concise description of unconditional love. We were called there to, to forgive each other, be kind, compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Don't read over that quickly this morning. Let the, the power and the focus of that sink in, because I like to, to, to describe that as unqualified acceptance. That's a, that's a pretty big statement. I recognize that. Uh, and it sets the bar pretty high. Unqualified acceptance and unlimited forgiveness. In our own strength, in our own hearts and minds, apart from Christ, we cannot achieve that. But when we begin to imitate God, when we begin to imitate Christ, we begin to move in that direction. There's a, there's a significant power, my friends, in that kind of love. It's a kind of power that can, can change lives. It can impact a life for eternity. Here's a story that came across about years ago at John Hopkins. One of the professors sent his graduate students to a very poor area, uh, a slum, to survey. He wanted them to find 200 young men 200 boys to be able to study their environment and their habits and everything about their life 
to see if out of that they could predict what would what their lives would be like. What would what would they become? What was it about these boys ages 12 to 16 that their background and their environment might help them predict the future? And so obviously that would be helpful in in training up others. Well, the students went to work, they did the research, they consulted social statistics, they compiled all the data that they could. And one of the things that they deducted from their study was that 90 percent of these young men were going to end up in jail. That was just the, the kind of environment and context in which they were living. There were other things a part of that study. Twenty five years later, another group of students were instructed to see if they could go and determine how accurate was the previous study. So their task was to find these 200 young men who now were adults and see what had actually happened to them. Well, amazingly, they were able to find 180 of those 200 who are now men. And they went to work again to try to find out uh, out of these men what, was, what had happened. One of the most shocking things that they, that they did discover as they found, they found 180 of them they were so surprised that out of those 180, only four of them had ended up in j- doing any jail time at all, in any prison time. Only four completely blew that study out of the water that, from what had been predicted. And so now the task was to find out what happened. How could these men grow up in that kind of environment and, and a, a breeding ground of crime and yet have such a surprisingly good record? What was it? And so they began to ask question after question and suddenly something began to appear and it was this common statement that in in the end, it seemed like invariably they would say, you know, is there anything else? And they would say, well, there was this teacher. (laughs) There was this teacher. And so they began to study that and they found out that in 75% of the cases, it was the same teacher. The same woman that somehow had had influenced these guys. And so now the researchers went to find the teacher who was living in a home for retired teachers. By this time, they they wanted to know how she could have exerted such a remarkable influence over a group of slum children. What had she done? What what particular technique had she used? What did she what had she done? They asked if she could give any reason why these boys would remember her. And she couldn't. She couldn't think of anything in particular that she had done. But then, almost to herself as she reflected back over those years, she said this. Oh, but I loved those boys. I loved those boys. Friends, that's the power of God's love. To enable us to become imitators of God our Father. And I've looked at this and I've studied this this week. I've come to the conclusion that that this is not so much a command from Paul as it is this invitation from God himself. As he invites us to come and walk with him so that we might become more like him. As we look through the Gospels, and I encourage you sometime as you read one of the Gospels or the Gospels to pay attention to how often Jesus invited people to follow him. Some of you may be today using the King James Version and you'll notice that there the word for imitate is actually follow. Be followers of God. So that it's not so much a, 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 a state of arrival, a, a, a level of achievement, this imitation of God as it is a, a journey of walking with God day by day. And we find there that Jesus continued to invite people to follow him, to join him, to enter into a lifelong relationship with him, because he knew that the more we are with him, the more we will become like him and the more we will become like our father in heaven. And even in calling of the 12 disciples, Mark tells us in his version in Mark 314 that he called these disciples. He spent the night in prayer up on the side of the mountain Then he came down and he called those disciples. To be his disciples, he appointed 12 of them, designating them as apostles. And then this phrase, maybe you've seen it before, that they might be with him. You realize that's the outstanding qualification for an apostle, for a disciple, for a follower, 
for someone who imitates God, who follows Jesus, is that they might be with Him. My challenge as you go today is not only to ask, how much are you like Jesus? But to ask, how much do you love like Jesus? For if you love like Him, you will be becoming like Him. You will imitate God. God who is at the very essence, as we peel back all the layers, what we find is a God of love. This morning as we conclude, I'm going to ask you to spend some moments in prayer. I feel that the, the text that we've looked at this morning is really a critical one. We could just say, oh, isn't that a nice statement? Isn't that a, wasn't that a nice sermon? No. It is absolutely critical that we embrace the love of God so that we can take that love to one another and to our community. In prayer, would you once again, this morning, just recommit yourself to loving God. Tell God of your love for Him. Then in obedience, would you, would you forgive someone like Jesus? As in Christ, God has forgiven you. I know that's a tall order. I know that asks a lot. And some of the hurts that we bear are so deep and long. But would you, as you have been forgiven, would you forgive someone? And then there's a, if you're following in the notes, there's a a blank space there. Where you might, I'm praying that God would give you the name of someone this morning that, that you might show love to this week. Will you purposefully show love? love to someone that needs to experience the love of God. And one of the basic ways, primary ways, maybe the only way they will experience God's love is through you loving them. Would you do that? It might be someone in your family. It might be someone at work. It might be someone in your classroom. It might be someone in the neighborhood. I don't know. God is able to do that. And then lastly, as we stand to sing in a few moments, I'm going to I've been asked I've asked some of our pastors and our elders or our church council just to be here. Maybe you'd like to come and pray with someone this morning. Pray about God's love in your life or the ability, the capacity to forgive someone or maybe join as someone did this morning to me, uh, came and said, would you pray with me for this person? I think he's moving towards Jesus. He's on a journey. God has, God has allowed some illness into his life. He, he was raised in another whole tradition, but I think he's moving. Would you pray with me? Those kinds of things. If God prompts you this morning, we'll have be some of us up here. And during the singing, just come and let us pray with you. So, Randy, if you'd come and prepare to sing, let's go to prayer for a few moments. And then we want to sing and, and continue to pray as we sing together. But God... Thank you for your great love for us. Thank you that you loved the world so much that you sent your one and only son, Jesus, into the world. That whoever believes in him should not perish, need not perish, will not perish because they will have eternal life. Life eternal. Life with a quality of uh, a heavenly quality about it. An eternal life that begins now and extends out into the realm of your presence in heaven. Thank you, God. Is there someone here this morning, Lord, that that needs to allow you to embrace them with your love, would you open their heart to you that they might embrace Jesus as their Savior and Lord, they might experience this relationship that we're talking about, a life of growing in Christ's likeness, walking close to Jesus. Lord, help us today to be able to extend the forgiveness to others that you've extended to us. As difficult as that is sometimes, we need your spirit to help us do that. And then help us to take your love to someone. Lord, I can just imagine uh, hundreds of us scattering this week and and deliberately, on purpose, expressing this extending love to someone through an act of kindness, through a word of affirmation, through... um, a gift of love through an expression of caring. It could be, there's hundreds and hundreds of things that we can do, God, but I just imagine us going out into this community now and being lights of your love, the power of your love. Would you, would you do that through us, Lord Jesus? 
as we scatter for this week before we come back next week to, to be recharged and encouraged once again. So I thank you, God, again. Thank you for loving me. As, as undeserving as I am. I thank you for your call on my life to be your son. And that, that I want that God to define me more than anything else. And I'm a child of God. Thank you for my friends, my my church here this morning, Lord, and the many who will join me in that for their own personal lives. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your love. We stand now to sing about that and to make our commitments. And we love you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's stand and sing. And if you would like to pray with a pastor or an elder, please come. doesn't mean that you have a problem. Uh, but it's a way that we can share God's love with one another and find strength in, in one another. seated for a few more moments. Um, we want to receive some friends into the church membership this morning. And so I'd invite those who uh, are coming today. You've, some of you have come by a testimony. Last Sunday we had baptism and some of those were here in the first service. Uh, if you're here in this service, please come right now. And uh, we just want to welcome you into the church family. Thank you. You just stand and face the audience, if you would, for a few moments. Great. So I think I can uh, remember, get all these names correct, correctly. Oh, thank you, Roy and Marge and David. Maybe you can just go over on that end over there. Thank you very much. Richard and Carol Nabokowski uh, wanted to join our membership and uh, transfer by testimony, and they shared that uh, a few weeks ago. Uh, Pete and Leah Martinez uh, coming to us from a local church here and shared their testimony with our deacons the other evening. Um, Vern and Linda 
Did I get it right? Vernon and Linda Anderson coming from the neighborhood church in Visalia and have moved here. And um, Joel and Amber Kersey. Uh, Joel is on staff at uh, Emmanuel High School where he serves in the Bible department and as the chaplain uh, there. And there they want to join us. Coming from our Bethany MB Church and having moved here are Roy and Marge and David Dick. And so these folks want to join us in membership. And if you would be willing to Love them the way we talked about this morning. Uh, would you just put up your hand and say, yes, we welcome you into the church family. And uh, I thank you for that. Um, I want to be the first to go by and welcome them into church membership. But friends, uh, thank you for following the prompting of the Holy Spirit. I always believe this isn't just a, you know, a formality or an accident. This is a divine appointment. God knew that we would be together here today and he wants us to walk together. You have wonderful gifts to share with this church. We have ministries that we want to bless you, keep blessing you with. And so it's this mutual relationship that is so vital in the local church as we together represent the body of Christ out in the world. So thank you. We welcome you into the, the membership of our church. As we dismiss, would some of you uh, come by and just welcome them uh, in church membership? Membership. Introduce yourself if you don't know them. Let them know who you are. Uh, there'll be a test later that they will remember all of your names. Not really. But uh, God bless you. I want to just give you the benediction. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing as you abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go and walk in the love of Christ. Go and take the love of God into this community and let the light of Jesus Christ shine through you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. See you at the picnic.